What's going on everybody and welcome to today's online class. On the agenda today is chapter 7, the vitamins. But before we get started, we're just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. So tonight you have your diet analysis part A due. So that should be uploaded to NYU classes using the instructions that are available there. And today I am introducing diet analysis project part B. And what this is, is a two-page, double-space, 12-point font analysis of that report that you uploaded to uh, NYU classes. So this is going to count as 50 points of your total grade. It's also going to be submitted to NYU classes, this time as a Word document. So that's the format that you need it in and it is not due until April 15th by 11 p.m. so you have plenty of time to work on it. And so you can read through this whole thing in your own time but essentially what the assignment is asking you to do is to analyze the results of those uh, three-day average reports and in doing so you're gonna have to draw on a lot of the information and, and concepts that we've learned in this class. So what I don't want you to do is I don't want you to just summarize the three-day average. I don't want you saying on Monday I had this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner, then on Tuesday I had this for breakfast, this for lunch, this for dinner. I can see all that stuff just by looking at your part A. What I want you to do for this one is do an analysis and you can use these questions below to guide you. So things you're going to be looking at is how many calories consumed compared to the amount of calories that were estimated. You're going to look at your macronutrient distribution range and compare that to the AMDR that we've learned about. And then you can look at your individual micronutrient intake and how that compares to the recommendations uh, that are outlined in that average report. So. The key is to use the concepts that we've learned as far as the recommendations go for specific nutrients. And then one thing I really want you to pay attention to and include in your analysis is which foods contributed to those results. So if you tell me that you fell short of the recommendation for calcium, uh, you want to give an explanation for why that occurred. For instance, if you fell short in calcium, perhaps you could say, well, I'm lactose intolerant, I don't eat any dairy products, and therefore I fell short in calcium. That's acceptable. What is not acceptable is just saying, I fell short in calcium, and not giving any kind of explanation. So you always want to tie the foods that you ate and how they influence the results that you received. So you can read this in your own time. And for additional guidance, I've taken a... Uh, submission from last semester from a student who did very well and I posted this to NYE classes as well so you can use hers just as guidance um, and it gives you a good example or an idea of what a perfect uh, assignment looks like so that's it for that so you have a couple weeks to focus on it now we have chapter 7, the vitamins. And this is a transition point in our class because so far we've looked just at the macronutrients, which were the proteins, carbs, and fats. So now we're transitioning to the micronutrients, which is going to include the vitamins and the minerals. So vitamins are learning objectives. We're going to look at the functions and the characteristics of the fat-soluble vitamins first. And then we're going to move into those functions and characteristics of the water-soluble vitamins. From there, it's going to take up the large majority of our course. Uh, from there, we're just going to look at some of the arguments for and against taking vitamin supplements. So just starting with a definition and classification of vitamins, vitamins are defined as an essential, non-caloric, and organic uh, nutrient and we can break this down so essential means that we need to consume them in our diet non-caloric meaning they don't provide calories or they don't provide energy and organic and we learned early on in the semester 
that means that they're carbon containing. In addition to vitamins, we also have things called vitamin precursors. So these are things in our food that we don't aren't the actual vitamins, but they're things that will be transformed into the active vitamin in the body. And the one that we focus in on is something called beta carotene, and this is a precursor for vitamin A. We have two classes of vitamins. We have the fat soluble vitamins, which is A, D, E, and K. Not sure why they listed it this way. These are usually listed as D, E, K, A also known as the DECA vitamins. That's the easiest way to remember the fat soluble ones. So those are the fat soluble ones. And then we have the water soluble, which includes vitamin C and the B vitamins, which is a, um, a category that includes several different. In terms of absorption, you guys should know this from our previous uh, lectures. Which ones do you think are absorbed into the blood? and which ones do you think are absorbed into the lymph, right? These are water soluble, just like carbohydrates and protein. So those are gonna be absorbed directly into the blood and sent to the liver. These ones are fat soluble and they're gonna be absorbed into the lymph system and eventually delivered into the bloodstream. And we'll see how uh, these things can be compared and contrast, contrasted. And we could look at vitamin names. We have the fat soluble, the DECA vitamins, and then we have the water soluble B vitamins. As I said, there's several of them, and we'll look at most of these, not all of them, in a little bit more detail. And then we have vitamin C. As far as characteristics of the fat soluble and water soluble vitamins, I think this is a rather important slide for you guys to be familiar with uh, because it actually you know, will lead into uh, some of the recommendations that we'll see and the risk for toxicities. So we've already mentioned this, absorbed like fats first into the lymph and then into the blood for the fat soluble. And for the water soluble, they're absorbed directly into the blood. In terms of transport and storage, fat soluble vitamins require a protein carrier in the watery body fluids and they're stored in the liver or fatty tissue. So our body does a very good job of storing these vitamins. Looking at the water soluble, they are not stored. So we, we do store the fat soluble and we do not store, with the exception of vitamin B12, uh, the water soluble vitamins. Along these same lines with excretion, since we store them, we say they're not readily excreted, right? We don't get rid of them easily, whereas with the water soluble, we do. And also for the same reason, uh, we're more likely to develop a toxicity of the vitamins that are fat soluble as opposed to the ones that are water soluble. Because if we take too much of the water soluble, then we'll usually just pass it out in the form of our urine. But since we tend to store these, those can build up in our tissues and lead to a toxicity. So with the storage, uh, it says here, right, with these we need them in periodic doses because the body can draw on its stores. This means that if we don't have it for a couple days, it's not such a big deal. We won't develop a deficiency overnight. Whereas with the water soluble, uh, in just a couple days we can develop a deficiency of those. So we'll start with a little more uh, discussion on the fat soluble vitamins and then we'll go into them individually. So I've already said it, this should be drilled into your head. The DECA vitamins, that will help you to remember which ones are fat soluble. So these ones can be stored and this increases the risk of toxicity. They do not necessarily need to be consumed every day because if we have adequate stores and we can pull on those stores to maintain normal function, we still have daily recommendations though as part of the dietary guidelines or the uh, DRIs. Deficiencies of uh, fat soluble vitamins are going to vary in their prevalence. Right, It's very common for people to have vitamin D deficiency in the United States but it's extremely rare to have a vitamin E deficiency. Fat soluble vitamins also have diverse roles within the body. So 
with each vitamin, there's going to be a unique role that can be described, and that there's going to be distinct functions uh, of those vitamins. There is a tiny bit of overlap, but once we get to water-soluble vitamins, we'll see that with those ones, there's a significant overlap, and sometimes uh, the individual functions uh, is not is not so easy to um, not so easy to see as it is with the fat soluble. So we start with vitamin A and with vitamin A we have three active forms in the body. These are called retinol, retinal, and retinoic acid. When it comes to nutrition we usually focus on retinol and then we'll also focus on beta carotene. And the reason why we focus on retinol is because that is what is pr found primarily in food. So we store vitamin A in our body, it's a fat soluble vitamin, and we store it in our liver as retinol. Beta carotene is a pr common precursor to vitamin A, and as we saw, precursor means that beta carotene eventually can be turned into vitamin A in the body. There are other precursors for vitamin A, but they're in much smaller quantities, and they're gonna be beyond the scope of this course. Food sources of vitamin A, uh, animal products are a good source of the preformed vitamin A, especially uh, liver and fish oils. And then plants, those are the ones that are going to contain beta carotene. And where we find beta carotene is usually in our orange and yellow vegetables, things like carrots, sweet potatoes, and bell peppers. Vitamin A plays a few very important roles, uh, but primarily with eyesight. And what vitamin A does, it helps to maintain a healthy cornea. Uh, so you can see the cornea here. This is like the window. So vitamin A helps to keep a clear window for us. Vitamin A also helps with the process of light perception. And we'll see this illustrated on the next slide or an upcoming slide. Um, with night blindness. So when we have a change in light or change in lighting, vitamin A is something that helps our eyes adjust to that change and maintain uh, sufficient or adequate vision for us. When we don't have adequate vitamin A, we can get something called night blindness. This is usually the early stages of vitamin A deficiency. And that's when this process of light perception becomes a little bit diminished. So when you have a change in light, your eyes are not able to adapt as well. With more advanced forms of vitamin A deficiency, you can develop something called xerophthalmia, and this is uh, drying of the eye. So a xerosis is the drying of the actual eye, and keratinization, that is uh, hardening of the eye. So this condition, xerophthalmia, is a condition of uh, drying and hardening, and this is going to eventually lead to blindness. So a severe vitamin A deficiency is going to eventually lead to blindness. And while this is not a significant issue here in the United States, worldwide uh, it is a significant issue. Now we can see this concept of night blindness, and the example they give in our book is you driving down the road and you have a car coming on with their headlights. So when we have adequate uh, stores of vitamin A, we get flashed in the eye, but pretty quickly afterwards, uh, we'll, our eyes will recover and we'll be able to see the details of the road in front of us again. When we have night blindness, you get that flash of the bright lights, such as the headlights, and it's gonna momentarily blind you. So you're not going to have that pretty rapid response where you're able to see again, but there's going to be more of a delay. So with vit inadequate vitamin A, you do not recover but remain blind for many seconds or minutes. This is night blindness. Now we can see uh, with more advanced vitamin A deficiency, we get this keratinization, which is the hardening of the skin, and, the, and then uh, the xerosis as well with the, um, the drying. 
And when these two things happen here on the eye, obviously you can see this is very damaging and it can lead to blindness. Some other roles for vitamin A. Vitamin A has been found to participate in cell division and differentiation. So um, creating, you know, getting the genetic materials into different new cells and then also helping those cells develop their individual roles. Um, right, this is differentiation, helping cells develop their special uh, specific function. Vitamin A also plays a role in immune function. And a deficiency is going to create a downward spiral of malnutrition and infection. And this is going to become a theme that we see uh, in this lecture, but also in later lecture when we do diet and health or diet and disease. And basically what this just means is, right, a deficiency of vitamin A decreases immune function. Decrease in immune function is going to lead to infection, and that's going to further worsen our degree of malnutrition because once we get sick, we're going to impair our uh, ability to nourish ourselves. So you get this downward spiral where you're getting sick, you eat worse. You get more sick, you eat even worse, and that's going to eventually uh, lead in death. Finally, vitamin A plays a role in reproduction and growth, and we see this with uh, sperm and fetal development, and also uh, vitamin A plays a role in the development of bone and teeth. Vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin, and so there is a risk of toxicity with it. This is a uh, very low risk to happen with foods, but it can occur with supplements. The one food that's an exception, and you guys should highlight this one, is animal liver. So people who eat a lot of liver are going to be at increased risk of developing vitamin A toxicity. And if you just think about us humans, we saw that we store retinol in our liver. And so other mammals are going to do the same. And so if we eat their livers, we're going to get a high concentration in the food that we eat. So outside of liver... Uh, there's very low risk of becoming toxic with foods, but it can happen with supplements. Symptoms of a vitamin A toxicity, skin rashes, hair loss, bone abnormalities, and birth defects. Some groups that are a higher risk are pregnant women and children. Pregnant women, they're oftentimes taking a prenatal supplement that has vitamin A in it already, uh, or some kind of supplement. People who are becoming pregnant may have prenatal supplement. Whatever they're taking while they're pregnant may also have um, vitamin A in it. And then if they're taking additional vitamin A on top of that, then that's going to become an issue for them. Children, they're going to be a high-risk group for any kind of toxicity just because they're going to have a lower threshold and a lower capacity for um, withstanding high doses than adults. Our food sources of retinol, obviously liver as we looked at, fish oil, milk is one. Uh, if it's full fat, low fat and skim milk has uh, vitamin A added to it. And then some vegetables are going to have preformed vitamin A. So we can see what vitamin A deficiency and toxicity looks like and we get this nice cushion between 500 micrograms and 3,000 micrograms. Just as a note, guys, throughout the lecture, you are not going to be responsible for knowing individual recommendations. Uh, if there is one on the next exam, I'll make sure that you know about it uh, through the review sheet. But we can just see how uh, deficiency and toxicity uh, can have serious uh, negative consequences. But you do have this wide range of normal intake to maintain health. Here are sources of the active vitamin A. You can see that some pills are going to give that 3,000, which is on the upper end of the tolerable intake. Uh, the calf's liver, just one ounce, is not too far behind. So that was a very rich source. Uh, regular multivitamins are going to have about half of the high potency. And then down here, we can see milk, 150 micrograms. And as I said, that is a 
whole milk that has it naturally. Uh, the soy milk, I mean not soy milk, uh, low fat milk and skim milk has it added back in, in the fortification process. This brings us to beta carotene and that is the precursor to vitamin A and this is the one that we find in the yellow and orange vegetables. So the conversion to active vitamin A is not one to one, meaning one microgram or one unit of beta carotene does not equal one microgram or one unit of vitamin A. It's more like one to 12. So you would need to consume 12 micrograms or units of beta carotene pr to produce one unit of preformed vitamin A. And because of this, uh, they have designed what's called the retinal activity equivalence, and that just creates uh, an even playing field. So one, you, one RAE is equal to 12, um, I think, micrograms of beta carotene, but one RAE is one microgram of preformed vitamin A. And this is, um, like I said, just to create a playing field, uh, even playing field. So anytime we're looking at vitamin A, we're using the same currency and we don't have to do these conversions in our head. Toxicity. Uh, there is no toxicity from beta carotene that's going to be dangerous to our health because the conversion lacks the efficiency. Uh, but we may develop an orange tint to our skin. This is um, just cosmetic, really. It's not dangerous. Uh, and we'll see what it looks like on the next slide. So our food sources is found in a, a wide variety of uh, orange fruits and vegetables, uh, but things like sweet potatoes, carrots, and bell peppers. This is what it may look like with excess beta carotene. So this would be somebody without the condition, but somebody that has consumed an excess may get this orange tint to them. And if this happens to you, if your skin ever changes color like this, I want to just assume that you're consuming too much beta carotene. If it's a noticeable difference, you should seek medical attention just in case uh, there's something else going on. And this is just a summary slide, so we'll get these for each of our nutrients. Um, but these are the food sources, and you can see uh, this is in micrograms, and it's all been converted. Mm. I take that back. Please ignore it. I can't see if this is in the RAEs. Yeah, the, the recommendations are in RAE. Whatever the case may be, um, you guys are, are, I don't think you're ever going to be tested or quizzed on RAE. It was kind of just a fun fact for you to be aware of. That brings us to vitamin D. So, Vitamin D is actually one vitamin that's not considered an essential nutrient. And the reason for this is because the body can synthesize all it needs using sunlight. So if the definition of essential is that we must be obtained from the diet, well, that doesn't hold true for vitamin D. And a lot of people know that we get vitamin D from the sun. And it you know, it kind of dawned on me one day that people actually think the sun just produces vitamin D and sends it our way and we just catch the vitamin D from the sun and that's how we get it. Uh, and that's not true. So I wanted to add this picture just so you have an idea of what actually happens. So we have an inactive form of vitamin D in our skin cells. And then when it receives sunlight, the sunlight activates that inactive form. And from there, there's a series of conversions of it becoming active vitamin D, where it's actually going to have uh, physiological relevance in our body. So one step makes it cholecalciferol, then it's going to pass through the liver, it's going to become a different form, it's going to pass through the kidney, and then it's going to become the active form here. Roles of vitamin D, primary role of vitamin D is in calcium regulation. So it helps to keep the blood calcium levels at a desirable, uh, at a desirable amount. 
So what vitamin D is, it actually works to increase calcium level, and it can do so by acting on three different locations. The first one is the bone, so vitamin D can act on the bone to pull calcium out into the bloodstream. It can work on the small intestine to help increase the absorption of calcium. And then it can also work on the kidneys. Uh, cal calcium is going to be excreted in the form of urine, and vitamin D can help act on the kidney to help to conserve some of that. Some other roles, vitamin D be behaves as a hormone, and similar to vitamin A, it plays a role in the cell cycle. There's also some hints from research that vitamin D is very important uh, in the prevention of things like heart disease, cancer, and other chronic diseases like Alzheimer's. So there is evidence to suggest there's a connection between vitamin D and these diseases, uh, but the understanding of the mechanisms and exactly what it does is pretty unclear. Uh, so we're not going to get into that for this class, but it's definitely important to know that uh, there seems to be more, to, more than meets the eye when it comes to vitamin D, and it has an influence on a, a wide range of things uh, regarding our health. When we have too little vitamin D, it's very dangerous to our bones. So we have some uh, very clear deficiency diseases with vitamin D. In children, we call that deficiency of vitamin D rickets. And with that comes a recommendation for the prevention of rickets. The American Academy of Pediatrics recommends that uh, breastfeeding infants are given 400 IU per day of vitamin D to uh, prevent this condition. Infants who are fed a certain amount of formula per day uh, will not need this additional vitamin D because the formula is going to be fortified with vitamin D. But uh, human breast milk is not going to contain a sufficient amount. For adults, we don't have rickets, but it's called osteomalacia, and this is a softening of the bones. And then also with adults, we have something called osteoporosis, and this is when the bones become porous and brittle, and we increase our risk significantly of things like fracture. So for this slide, it's important to know that rickets is in children, and in adults, we have osteomalacia and osteoporosis. So the bowed legs, this is a hallmark sign of rickets in children, and also these uh, beads. And the things have to add up, right? So if we have a child with bowed legs or we see these beads on the chest, we don't just automatically say that the child has rickets. There has to be other things that measure up, like um, their exposure to sunlight, their what they were eating, what they were drinking, uh, and then you can use other uh, materials from their history to figure out if that could be what's actually going on. We do have certain groups who are at risk of vitamin D deficiency. So those that need to be monitored are those that have little exposure to, uh, to sunlight, especially people in northern climates in the winter months, uh, places like New York City where we're not getting a lot of direct sunlight. And even if we are getting direct sunlight in the winter months, uh, the sun is not at, we're not receiving the rays at the right angle that they're going to produce vitamin D. Other people that will have little exposure to sunlight, uh, sedentary individuals who spend most of their time uh, inside, and that's going to include the elderly who may be too frail uh, or too sick to go outside. Individuals with dark skin, are at increased risk of deficiency uh, because they do not convert as well using the sun rays. Uh, this would include African Americans. Breastfed infants, as I already mentioned, human breast milk provides an insufficient amount of vitamin D. And then those who avoid vitamin D fortified foods and fish. Uh, this, I would say, is true, um, although we do not get a significant amount of vitamin D from foods and fish, although they will help a little bit to our total intake. One thing of note when it comes to deficiency, adequacy, toxicity, uh, and even optimal, 
the for our vitamin D levels in our blood. It's a point of contention for many health professionals. So depending on who you ask, they might have a different response for what an appropriate amount of vitamin D to take in and what an appropriate amount to have in your blood is. So those, these are some of those factors that are affecting vitamin D synthesis. So as we age, the skin loses some of the capacity to synthesize vitamin D. Um, city living, tall buildings blocking sunlight. Clothing, if you wear a long sleeve and pants all the time, you're going to block the sunlight. Let's see. Uh, geography, already mentioned. Homebound, already mentioned. Uh, season. Skin pigment, already mentioned. Sunscreen, so people who use sunscreen before going outside may be at risk because it's not allowing for the uh, proper, um, one, proper conversion. And then time of day. So if you go out in early morning hours or as the sun's going down, you're probably not going to get that same response. On the opposite end of deficiency, we're going to have toxicity. And they call this in the book the most potentially toxic vitamin. So what this does is too much vitamin D is going to increase blood calcium concentrations to an undesirable amount. And when this occurs, we can actually develop calcium deposits in our soft tissues. So this can lead to organ failure throughout, uh, but specifically noted is kidney and heart failure. It can make your heart stop. So... Uh, risk of high doses is very clear, and most often this is seen with people who go on self-prescribed supplement regimens. Maybe they hear that vitamin D is really important and they, they should take a supplement, and they adopt the more is better mentality uh, when this is not necessarily true, and then taking advice from the wrong individuals. Uh, there are certainly people out there who are recommending excessive amounts of vitamin D uh, to an unhealthy degree. Our recommendations for vitamin D are steady throughout life. From our 19 to 70 years old, the recommendation is for 600 IUs per day. And then as we get older, above 70, we have that decreased ability to synthesize. It goes up just a small amount to 700 IU. Food sources do not play a very significant role in our vitamin D intake, but good sources are fatty fish like salmon and egg yolk. We also have fortified products, so we see dairy products, juice, and cereal be fortified with vitamin D. And what this means is that the original product does not contain vitamin D, but it's added in to make sure that Americans are getting enough of it. Dairy products is chosen because dairy products is an excellent source of calcium, and as we've already seen, calcium and vitamin D go hand in hand, so it goes naturally together. Toxicity for vitamin D does not happen from sunlight. Uh, even people who spend all day outside without sunscreen, eventually your body's going to get to a point where it's just not going to continue to produce or convert more vitamin D. So toxicity cannot occur that way. Uh, not from food either, but definitely from supplements. And here is our summary sheet for vitamin D. And these will be good for you guys to go over once you comes time for studying for the exam. They just give you a nice snapshot. On to our third fat soluble vitamin would be vitamin E. And when we talk about vitamin E, we're talking about the uh, tocopherols. There are four of them but the primary form is alpha tocopherol. Uh, I can't really say that word uh, too well. Role of vitamin E is an antioxidant, and what antioxidants do is they protect against inflammation and damage to DNA. We'll see what that looks like on the next slide. Deficiency of vitamin E is not seen in humans. What we know about is mostly from laboratory animals, uh, but what we have found is that it leads to a loss of muscle coordination uh, and reflexes and also impaired speech. Well, maybe they've seen that in humans unless somebody's talking to animals.
and the animals are talking back. So this is what antioxidants like vitamin E do. Just as part of natural metabolic processes in our body, we develop or produce things called free radicals. And what these do is they just basically wreak havoc throughout our body. Um, and so we can see here with this domino effect, what they do is they affect one thing and this leads to a series of events where many things throughout the body are going to be affected. And we have them listed here. It can lead to cell membrane lipid damage, uh, protein damage, DNA damage, the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, which we know uh, plays a role in cardiovascular disease, and also inflammation, which we know is uh, harmful if it's going to be for the long term. So these things uh, obviously detrimental to our body and can lead to the development of diseases like heart disease, cancer, um, among others. So what antioxidants do is they basically stand in the way of these free radicals and they say, all right, buddy, you're, it stops here. So we see how this knocks all the pins down while antioxidant stands in the way and absorbs that free radical to stop it from doing its damage. So we have many different antioxidants. Another one that we'll see later on is uh, vitamin C has antioxidant properties. Uh, but vitamin E is an antioxidant, and that's its primary role. Toxicity from vitamin E is only likely with supplemental intake, uh, not from food. And when this occurs, you have an increased risk of bleeding. Recommendations for vitamin E. Uh, you don't need to know the specific amount, but I think it is important to know that smokers have an increased risk uh, or increased need for things like vitamin E and also vitamin C, the antioxidants, because smoking uh, is going to naturally do oxidative damage or produce free radicals. Where do we find vitamin E? We find it in plant oils, nuts, seeds, and whole grains. And so we can see that in the US, we get enough from these foods to prevent a deficiency. But according to these uh, intake statistics, we do not get enough on average to satisfy the DRI recommendation. Uh, and this is consistent for a lot of vitamins and minerals, especially because they're found in uh, plant-based foods, things like nuts, seeds, legumes, uh, and whole grains. And here's our sun, uh, summary slide. You can see uh, canola oil, safflower oil, mayonnaise. This ends up being the way that a lot of people get their vitamin E in. And most oftentimes things like canola oil, safflower oil are things people are consuming without even realizing. Uh, they're just part of the meal preparation of wherever they're getting food or uh, used in the production of packaged goods. On to the fourth fat-soluble vitamin, vitamin K. Uh, the roles for this one uh, is in blood clotting and also uh, plays a role in the formation of bone proteins. Food sources of vitamin K are leafy green vegetables. But another one, which we've learned in a previous lecture, is that our gut bacteria can actually produce vitamin K. So we get it from two different, two different routes, from our food, and also from our gut bacteria. Uh, deficiency in humans is pretty rare. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in uh, very severe cases of malnutrition, uh, but mostly seen in newborn infants, right? When a newborn comes out of the womb, it's not gonna have the gut bacteria uh, or enough of it to produce vitamin K to give them sufficient amounts. And obviously when they come out of the womb, uh, immediately they're not going to have leafy green vegetables. And because of this, one of the advances in medicine has been uh, when a newborn comes out of the womb, one of the first things that happens is that a nurse comes, sticks it with a needle uh, with a vitamin K injection. 
And what this is to do is to help promote blood clotting to prevent uh, the baby from having any uh, what they call hemorrhages or bleeding out, which can be uh, very life-threatening or deadly. Unfortunately, we've seen uh, with the rise of things like anti-vaccination movements, uh, we've also seen people who uh, have raised concern about the vitamin K injection, uh, but it is certainly recommended and is uh, considered uh, dangerous to deny the vitamin K injection. With toxicity, you can develop something called jaundice, which is a yellowing of the skin. So our food sources, our dark leafy green vegetables are going to be the best ones. Things like spinach, kale, broccoli, and cabbage. We also find high amounts of vitamin K in things like soybeans, green peas, and black-eyed peas. There is some uh, drug nutrient interactions that occur with vitamin K, uh, most prominently with this anticoagulant medication called warfarin. And what warfarin does is it helps people who are at high risk of things like uh, heart attacks or strokes uh, to keep their blood from clotting undesirably. Uh, and so what happens is if you're taking warfarin to thin your blood, and you're eating tons, of, I mean, yeah, and you're eating tons of vitamin K on top of it, uh, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive, right? On one hand, you're taking a drug to keep your blood thin, and on the other hand, you're taking in a lot of vitamin K, which is going to promote clotting. So what ends up happening is you uh, get a lot of doctors or medical professionals who are telling their patients uh, that you need to stop eating green vegetables, so you shouldn't you should really cut back on the amount you're eating, and sometimes uh, patients will come in saying that their doctor have, has told them to stop eating vegetables altogether. Well, this is not uh, something that is recommended. What is recommended is that the person who is on warfarin achieves consistency in their intake, meaning that on maybe not a day-to-day -day basis, but a week-to-week -week basis, they should try to consume the same amount of vitamin K foods. For instance, if somebody is eating spinach and broccoli on an everyday basis, that's okay as long as they continue to do so. What you don't want happening is somebody who eats spinach and broccoli every single day for one week and then the, what next week they don't eat any at all. So you want to get a consistent intake and then the doctors can adjust the medication around it to, do, uh, to have a desirable amount and avoidance altogether is undesirable. And I, I feel pretty confident saying that any medication that tells you that you can't eat any more vegetables is probably uh, not the best route, and you should seek other advice. So this is our summary slide for vitamin K. And you can see all the leafy green vegetables there. So that's it for the fat-soluble vitamins, and now we are moving into the water-soluble vitamins. So these are those that dissolve in water. They are absorbed directly into the bloodstream and go into the liver. Unlike the fat-soluble, they do not require a protein for transport in the blood, and they are radically excreted in the urine. So if we have too much of them, right, instead of getting a toxicity, we're most often going to just get rid of it in the form of urine. They are not stored well, the one exception really being vitamin B12, which is stored to a degree in our body. And in terms of food choices, they need to be consumed frequently to avoid deficiency. Because if we're constantly using it, we're not storing it, uh, we can become deficient rather quickly. The first one we'll look at is vitamin C. So vitamin C plays a role in the formation of connective tissues, uh, most uh, importantly collagen. So this is uh, a component of the structural proteins, things like our skin, our bone, our ligaments, our tendons, uh, our muscle. Collagen is important there, and vitamin C is an essential component of it. Vitamin C also acts as an antioxidant, and we saw 
what that does inside the body with vitamin E. Uh, but vitamin C also plays an interesting role as a component of food in our gastrointestinal tract. And once we get to our next lecture when we learn about iron, uh, we can see that vitamin C uh, is going to play an important role in helping to facilitate the absorption of iron by, by its antioxidant capabilities. So keep that in mind. Uh, vitamin C, this is the one that everyone starts feeling a cold and what they do, they just take high doses of vitamin C and think it's going to work. Uh, well, spelling mistake here. But what has been found is that adequate intake is important um, for maintaining your health, preventing the common cold, but there's not really significant benefits of taking high doses once you're sick. Uh, so when they've run these studies, what they may found is that people's symptoms improve just by maybe a matter of hours or maximum a day, uh, but it's not really considered to be significant. Deficiency of vitamin C uh, results in a deficiency disease called scurvy, and this is characterized by things like weakness, loss of appetite, loose teeth, and anemia. We can see pictures here. Uh, I, th I, I think it's rather painful, uh, but the teeth fall out. Toxicity. There's a wide range in safe dose, so from 10 milligrams, which is a very small amount, all the way up to two grams uh, is considered safe. And with a mild toxicity, uh, usually in the form of supplemental intake, it can cause diarrhea. So uh, before anything truly harmful is gonna happen from taking vitamin C, you'll probably end up on the toilet. Some individuals have increased demand of vitamin C. Those are people who use tobacco because they have an increased need for antioxidants. And then other things, physical stressors or wounds. So, um, you know, big surgical wounds, uh, pressure injuries that develop in patients who are bed bound. Uh, vitamin C will help to create that collagen, create the new tissue, and heal up those wounds. Our food sources of vitamin C, fruits and vegetables, that's very general, and that's because a high amount of vitamin C is found in a wide range of fruits and vegetables. Not just oranges, uh, but a, a vegetable that contains a significant amount of vitamin C is bell peppers. Vitamin C is one nutrient, uh, along with the other water-soluble vitamins, that we have to be careful with losses in cooking because it is uh, easily destroyed. And so if we do certain things in our food preparation, we can lower the amount that's in the food that we eat. So I've given you some tips. This should be circled and starred because it will appear on an exam. Uh, heat and oxygen are two things that will lead to losses of vitamin C. So some strategies for uh, maximizing the amount of vitamin C in the foods that you make. Uh, one, minimize the water when steaming vegetable and also use a color cover. So when you cook with a lot of uh, water, the vitamin C is going to leach out into that water, and then when you dump all that water down the down the drain, you're losing the vitamin C. Uh, same thing with the steam. When you produce a lot of steam from it, that vitamin C is going to disappear in the air. So you can cover it uh, and use a little bit of water to try to maximize the vitamin C that remains in the food. Uh, in terms of oxygen, if you pre-cut food, and you expose it to air, it's gonna to lead to the destruction of vitamin C. So if you cut apples, and you leave them on, out on the counter till they turn brown, uh, you're gonna decrease the amount of vitamin C in it. And then just the general one, avoid high cooking temperatures and long cooking times. So when you're cooking vegetables, uh, cooking them on medium temperature, medium to high temperature, and not cooking them till they're mush, just cooking them till they can be uh, gently uh, pierced with a fork. And that's it for vitamin C. So you can see our recommendations here. Uh, wide range of fruits and vegetables. I mentioned orange and orange juices, uh, but you can see that uh, bell peppers really uh, is a strong candidate for, for taking the cake here.
Now we'll talk about the B vitamins in unison before we uh, look at some of them individually. And the reason we look at them in unison is because they have uh, many overlapping roles. So the B vitamins generally function as part of coenzymes. And we've already seen what enzymes are. Those are those proteins that help to facilitate reactions in the body. Well, coenzymes are things that combine with enzymes to activate it. So this is an additional component to the enzyme to help to facilitate those reactions. Vi uh, B vitamins play a role in energy metabolism, but they do not provide energy themselves. So this is a common misconception with things like vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. People take them and expect to get energy from them. Uh, those vitamins and the B vitamins, they help the pathways and the mechanisms to derive energy from things like proteins, carbs, and fat, but they do not provide energy themselves. So uh, taking more of vitamin B6 or vitamin B12 uh, probably isn't going to result in increased energy, energy production in any way. Unless, of course, uh, you're deficient in, in those nutrients. Uh, B vitamins, uh, there's two of them that play a role in the cell cycle. Uh, that would be folate and vitamin B12, and these ones are always linked together, and uh, we'll see why that's the case in an upcoming slide. So this is just a picture of our coenzyme action. We've already seen this before, right? We have two compounds that want to get together, but they don't quite know how, and so they use the enzyme to bring themselves together. Well, a lot of the B vitamins act as these coenzymes, so they sit on top of the enzyme and they help to facilitate the reaction. This picture, there's nothing specific that you need to know um, from this slide. It really just is here to show you that the effects of the B vitamins are very wide ranging. So they affect all the different organs and organ systems uh, with different, uh, different functions. Deficiency of the B vitamin. When you're deficient in B vitamins, almost every cell in your body is affected. Uh, and isolated deficiencies are difficult to identify. So if you're deficient in one B vitamin, you're most often deficient in another one as well. Uh, so it's usually um, you know, multiple, multiple deficiency signs at once. Uh, and these are just a couple of them. This uh, pale, uh, smooth tongue here, I believe this would be a sign of vitamin B12 deficiency. Uh, these cracks at the mouth, this is something called chelosis, and this would be a hallmark sign of a deficiency of uh, the vitamin uh, riboflavin. We'll spend the next few slides looking at some of the water-soluble vitamins individually. The first one up is thiamine. This plays a role in energy metabolism of all cells. It also helps to maintain nerve cell membranes. With a deficiency, we have a specific condition called beriberi. Uh, this was first seen in East Asia, uh, where people were consuming about 80 to 90% of their calories from white rice. And so uh, thiamine is found in whole grains. And so what you know, researchers or physicians found was that people who consumed the whole grains in these uh, societies were able to stave off this condition. But those who ate uh, predominantly the white rice uh, suffered because of it and developed things like extreme weakness. Beriberi is not common in the U.S. This is due to the fortification of grains and the enrichment of grains, really. Uh, that's when you're adding back, the, uh, adding back the nutrients that were taken out as part of the uh, processing of them. So when you go from whole wheat bread to white bread, you're taking out some of the thiamine, but the fortification or enrichment programs in the United States have made it mandatory that you add some of that uh, thiamine back in. 
alcohol abuse in the United States is a major contri contributor to thiamine deficiency. Uh, this is because alcohol abuse is going to impair the absorption of the nutrient, so you're not going to be able to get enough into your blood. And then also, uh, alcohol abuse is going to increase excretion. So it's a twofold thing. You're not getting enough in, and you're pushing too much out. Uh, when this occurs uh, over a long period of time, you can develop something called Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome, and this is a, a psychosis, psychological issues that are going to occur from vitamin deficiency, uh, vitamin B1 or thiamine deficiency. And these uh, B vitamins are going to go pretty rapid. Uh, here's our summary slide. Next up, riboflavin. So this, again, uh, like thiamine, plays a role in energy metabolism of all cells. Deficiencies, we saw in a picture before, cracks at the corners of the mouth, and hypersensitivity to light. Uh, dietary, dietary sources of this vitamin include milk products, meats, and enriched grains, and stability is limited. So UV light and irradiation are going to destroy it. Uh, UV light, this is the reason why milk comes in an opaque or a cardboard container, because if milk is uh, exposed to direct sunlight, it's going to lead to the destruction of riboflavin. Heat does not destroy the vitamin. Here is our summary page. Mmm, pork chops. Next up is niacin. This also is going to participate in energy metabolism. I think we see a theme here with all of the B vitamins. Deficiency of niacin is a specific condition called pellagra. And pellagra is characterized by the four Ds. Those Ds are diarrhea, dermatitis, it's a condition of the skin, dementia, which is going to be altered mental status, and death. Now, the only good news about the death is that once you get to here, you don't have to worry about the rest of them. Uh, with toxicity of niacin, uh, this was actually used as a medical treatment in the past, and it's sometimes... Uh, used today as well. And so what they found is that high doses of niacin can help to improve blood lipids. So for people who have high uh, cholesterol or blood lipids, then the uh, high doses of niacin can help to bring them down. This has actually fallen by the wayside, mainly because there's better developments in medicine these days, and there's other medications that are not going to come with such side effects, and they're going to have actually a better effect than the niacin. But some of the side effects that have been seen are liver injury, indigestion, and impaired glucose tolerance. And here is our summary slide. Pork chops again. They're on it with the pork chops. Next up is folate. So folate is one of those uh, vitamins that we saw that plays a role in the cell cycle. So in cell production and DNA synthesis. Uh, it also plays a role in the metabolism of vitamin B12. And we'll see that folate is very dependent on B12 to become active. So deficiency of folate can happen from low intake, impaired absorption, and there's certain medications that interfere with folate. Uh, one example being a medication called methotrexate, uh, and that can lead to vitamin, uh, folate deficiency. Outcomes of deficiency are anemia, diminished immunity, and then birth defects. And this is a big one. The folate in pregnancy. Uh, so a deficiency of folate can lead to birth defects. And the birth defect that occurs is called uh, neurotube defects. And this is going to be sp lead to spine issues, brain damage, uh, and possibly even death. So recommendations 
for women who are planning to become pregnant or are of uh, childbearing age is for 400 micrograms per day of folic acid, which is the supplemental form of folate. And this must be taken before pregnancy. So if somebody is planning to become pregnant, then they are recommended to take a prenatal supplement that contains at least 400 micrograms of folic acid, and that can be used to prevent the development of neural tube defects. Food sources of folate, we're also finding it in foods, right? We can get it in raw or lightly cooked vegetables and also enriched grains. Now, enrichment of grains is a mandatory thing that started in the late 1990s uh, to, help, uh, to help reduce the incidence of neural tube defects. And the reason for this, right, we can see that this is the recommendation and we take it before pregnancy. Uh, well, I don't know if this is news to you guys, but a lot of pregnancies are not planned. People do not know they're going to become pregnant. It just sort of happens. Uh, and so uh, the government stepped in and made an initiative to increase the amount of folate that every American was eating by enriching grains uh, to help make neural tube defects a thing of the past. And it's been somewhat successful. I, I'd say rather successful, actually. So you can see in the mid-1990s, uh, this was pre-fortification. Then 1996, it looks like, it became uh, optional. And then once it became mandatory, you can see you got a nice downward trajectory here. Uh, and so it's a relatively new, uh, well, it still feels new to me, uh, but some of you guys, I can't do the math right now. Well, it still feels new if it's in the 1990s. And it's... Uh, it's uh, been a good health initiative, good public health initiative. These are our good sources of folate and foods. Lentils is an excellent source and one that uh, here in America uh, we probably don't consume enough of. It's a very excellent food that's high in protein uh, and other vitamins and minerals. That brings us to vitamin B12, and this one is closely related to folate, and, because, and that's because folate depends on it for activation. So in our body, we consume folate, it goes around mostly in an inactive form, and then you need B12 available to get it from that inactive form to the active form. So if you don't have enough B12, then folate is left in the inactive form, and it's not able to do anything. So that's the primary role of vitamin B12. Vitamin B12 also plays a role in the maintenance of the health of nerve fibers. So because of this, when you have a deficiency of vitamin B12, you end up with neurological issues, uh, tingling of the hands and feet. Uh, you can have gait abnormalities or difficulty walking straight. And then related to folate, uh, you can have anemia. Vitamin B12 deficiency can be masked by high levels of folate. So if somebody has uh, anemia, that could be vitamin B12 or folate, and you give them a whole bunch of folate, well, the anemia is going to resolve, and so you might think everything's good and you fixed it, uh, but the vit vitamin B12 deficiency could still be there. And so when this happens, the uh, consequences... Uh, persist and they become more severe. So with this you can have malfunction of nerves and muscles and impaired cognition or altered mental status. For food sources of vitamin B, uh, B12, animal products. There are no viable sources from plants and we've already talked about this in class. You only get vitamin B12 from animal products uh, and so if you're following a vegan diet it's best to be supplementing with vitamin B12. So we can say all animal products with the exception of the enriched cereal. And so this does not occur naturally. It is added to it after the fact.
And vitamin B12 is an interesting one uh, in that we actually store it decently well and uh, deficiency usually won't show up till uh, uh, on average, I'd say about three years or later. So that's it. We made it through the fat soluble vitamins and we made it through the water soluble vitamins and we're going to finish up with just a couple slides on vitamin supplements looking at some of the uh, benefits and risks. So we do have some people in our population who are uh, prone to vitamin deficiencies. This would be people who are habitual dieters or those who are uh, chronically uh, trying to lose weight or trying different diets where they're excluding whole food groups. Uh, the elderly who have diminished appetite and are not eating enough total energy are going to be at risk for vitamin deficiencies. People with wasting illnesses, certain illnesses are going to increase the requirement for vitamins. And so if they just continue to eat their normal amount that they were eating when they were healthful, uh, it may not be enough to satisfy their requirement. And then people who admit fi uh, entire food groups. And this is going to fall in the category of habitual dieters. Uh, and this could also uh, be somebody who is following a exclusively vegan diet and does not consume any animal products. They're going to be at risk of a vitamin G B12 deficiency. The book gives us some valid reasons for taking supplements. So if you have a nutrient deficiency, uh, women who are capable of becoming pregnant, right, the folic acid in a prenatal supplement, uh, pregnant or lactating women, they may need iron or folate. Uh, newborns, they're given that vitamin K dose or they're given uh, vitamin D if it's needed. Say people who undergo weight loss surgery, especially when there's uh, gastric bypass surgery, there's certain vitamins that are going to need to be taken for the rest of their life. And the list goes on. You can spend time looking at this one, but uh, I think the important ones to know are the strict vegetarian with vitamin B12. And then also uh, later in the semester, this one is going to become important. The women who are capable of becoming pregnant, the pregnant women, the newborns and the infants. So you can go ahead and highlight those. Arguments against taking supplements. So food rarely causes imbalances and toxicities. And so we like to think food as this uh, perfect package of the nutrients that we need in the correct amounts. So supplement users likely to have in excessive intakes where food, if we're consuming enough energy and we're following the recommendations for intake, uh, then we should get the appropriate amount and balance for food. There is some concern with supplement contamination and safety, and this is because it's a, um, it's a system that is not well regulated. And you'll have to know this act uh, for our next exam, the Dietary Supplemental uh, Supplement Health and Education Act, also called DSHEA. And what this act does is it allows products to be put on the shelf and sold without going under testing prior to being sold. So just imagine me sitting in my apartment like I'm doing right now, uh, deciding I want to become a supplement manufacturer and just putting a bunch of stuff in a pill and then selling it. Uh, that's essentially what can be done with supplement companies and they're not going to be held responsible for the contents of their supplement uh, until an issue comes about. So this act, um, yep, products not evaluated before they're sold. That's what you need to know. Supplements can contain life-threatening misinformation. They are going to make large, grandiose uh, promises that they're going to cure disease or solve someone's issue, uh, which is not, in most instances, the case. And so this can be life-threatening. And then they also give you a false sense of security. So people think they do not need to follow the recommendations for things like vitamins, um, vitamins minerals, uh, and they can just get all those things from supplements. Uh, it's important to note that whole foods are always the best for nutrients. 
So some invalid reasons for taking supplements from our book. You fear that foods grown on today's soil lacks nutrients. You feel tired and falsely believe that supplements are going to give you energy. You hope that supplements can help you cope with stress and so on. Um, the one that you want to highlight from this is you wish to build up your muscles faster or without physical activity. The reason I want you to highlight this, I don't actually agree with this um, because there are uh, some supplements out there that do help with building up our muscles uh, faster. They're not going to do it without physical activity, but uh, I think an argument can be made that there are supplements out there that can help us to build up our muscles faster. And then we'll get to that when we do performance nutrition. Just some guidelines for selecting supplements. You always want to choose the type. So it's not a good idea to go into a supplement shop not knowing what you're looking for. Uh, so you want to know exactly what nutrient you're looking for and why. You want to read the label to see what the contents are, uh, or at least what they're claiming to be. You want to target your needs so you should know how much you're supposed to have of that nutrient for the supplement. And you should try to buy one that matches it. So that goes with choosing doses. You want to examine the quality. So you want to buy from reputable brands. And then we'll see on an upcoming slide uh, another measure to look at quality. And you want to avoid marketing traps. So if it sounds good to, uh, too good to be true, then it probably is. These are some resources for you guys uh, for supplements. Uh, NSF.org. This is a third-party testing service. So what, what uh, supplement companies can do is that before they put their product on the shelf, they can send their supplement to this testing site and NSF is going to analyze it in the laboratory to make sure that the, la the label uh, matches what it says it is, that it's safe to use, and then if they get their approval, they'll slap their NSF certified on the label. So they're a reputable company, and so if you see a supplement that has this NSF label on it, uh, you can assume that it's safe to take. These other two, examine.com and labdoor.com, I think they're good resources for people to have. Uh, they'll give you more information on supplements. This one is going to give you more description and the proposed effects along with uh, research articles that either are going to support or um, not support the claimed effects. And then Labdoor, this is another testing facility that uh, tests the products on their own and then they rank them in terms of purity and quality and all that stuff. So you can look at that on your own time. And that is actually the end of our lecture. So I don't know how long that was, but I feel like I talked a lot. Now. I'm not going to give any extra credit now that this is a mandatory thing that I have to teach online. So no extra credit for this one. Uh, but if you have any questions, please reach out to me via email. And if common questions come up, uh, maybe I'll make another video or write out uh, some information to send out to everybody to make sure everyone's on the same page. So thanks, uh, thank you guys for watching uh, and enjoy the rest of your day or night or morning whenever you're watching this.